Um, thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to the Canadian Public Health Association's Infectious Disease and Climate Change webinar series. This is the fifth, fifth webinar in our series where we're exploring current and emerging infectious disease and climate change topics to share knowledge, research and best practices. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the Canadian Public Health Association's office is situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. They have been the guardians of this land for millennia, and we are grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people and their governments in realizing truth, meaningful truth and reconciliation. Today's webinar, Study of Distribution of Invasive Mosquitoes in Newfoundland and Labrador and saint pierre et Miquelon, a citizen science approach, is brought to you by the Canadian Public Health Association through the Infectious Disease and Climate Change Project. I'm Jillian Pritchard, Project Officer with CPHA, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, before we begin the webinar, I'd like to take a quick minute to let you know about some other infectious disease and climate change projects that we've been undertaking here at CPHA. You can find more information about all of them at cpha.ca. The first thing is we recently launched a new resource package on our website, which is a compilation of the most recent research, reports, tools, and other evidence-based information regarding infectious disease and climate change in Canada. Um, also, on October 5th, we'll be holding an infectious disease and climate change forum, which will provide a dynamic and virtual environment to facilitate knowledge sharing of research and best practices among professionals and providers engaged in the field of infectious disease and climate change. We really encourage you all to en engage in this virtual event with us. And finally, last week, we, re we released a new report on infectious disease and climate change in Canada, which summarizes conversations with 16 key informants describing what is currently happening in Canada with respect to climate change and infectious disease. It also highlights opportunities and challenges within this emerging field of inquiry. Uh, so you can find that, all of those on our website. I encourage you to take a look after this webinar. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, it should be noted that all of our Zoom attendees are muted. And if you have any questions for the presenter, please type them into the Q&A box at any point during the webinar. And after the presentation, um, I will read the questions out loud and then our presenter will answer them. If you have any questions regarding technical difficulties, please also ask them in the Q&A box and we'll reply to you as soon as we can. And if multiple people are experiencing the same issue, we'll address the question live. Um, we really strongly encourage participation and we look forward to hearing your thoughts and your questions. And just a few quick notes um, that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on CPHA's YouTube channel a few days after the event. And the presentation slides will also be shared. We'd love to get your feedback, so please fill out our five-minute survey at the end of the webinar upon closing the webinar window. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Atanu Sarkar is an Associate Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Division of Community Health and Humanities, Faculty of Medicine, Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. He was trained in medicine and public health in India and has studied environment at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. His research interests are adverse impacts of climate change on health and food security and adaptation to climate change, environmental contaminations and adverse health impacts, indigenous health and sustainable development. He has published more than 30 research papers in peer reviewed journals, written four books, edited two volumes, seven chapters in edited volumes, and presented more than 70 papers in various national and international conferences. He's received several grants from federal tri-agencies, CIHR, SHRC, and NSERC, and provincial agencies. His presentation is based on the research project funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter, Dr. Sarkar. You can now start sharing your screen. Uh, thanks, uh, Jillian, for the uh, introduction. Now I'm going to share the screen. Uh, can you see, is it share? Yep, just put that and, on uh, full screen. Yeah, a full screen. Done? Perfect. Thanks, Jillian. And uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, for I First, I thank Canadian Public Health Association for uh, inviting me for this webinar. And I thank uh, Public Health Agency of Canada for funding our project. And you can see the our team members uh, 
first four actually graduate students. Uh, they extensively supported in collection samples and organizing these uh, data collection analysis lab work. Also, uh, 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 most of the faculties like uh, Dr. Tom Chapman and Ju Lang uh, from the Department of Biology. Whitney is also uh, affiliated to the Department of Biology and Provincial uh, uh, Retirement Vet Officer. Kate and Martha, the uh, from also biology department, Geol climate scientist from department of geography, and I am from the faculty of medicine. Before I make a presentation, uh, I acknowledge uh, uh, that we live and work on the ancestral homelands of Beatik, Mi'kmaq, Inu, and Inuit of Newfoundland and Labrador. So let's start. Uh, this is my presentation plan uh, of, of uh, aim and methods, why citizen science approach, what is our approach, and how sample we mobilize from field to lab. Uh, what are the major findings? What are the challenges due to pandemic? The, what lessons we have learned and way forward. So uh, I'm just going to change the, the window actually because sometimes obstructing some text. Okay. So uh, the aims of the study basically to explore the distribution of native and invasive species of mosquitoes across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador and in the French overseas territory of saint pierre Miquelon, which is very close to uh, our province. It is very close to Newfoundland. People go by ferries, they come for health services to St. John's. We have very, it is just two different continent politically, but uh, uh, geographically very close. And to explore the existence and distribution of viral pathogens in the mosquitoes. And we adopt a citizen science approach in identification collection and submission of mosquito species. So if you look at this map, get a map, look at the uh, location of St. John, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and Sapia Mikulan is very close to the island of Newfoundland. Now the question is, why have we selected citizen science instead of traditional surveillance of mosquitoes. You, uh, you all know that the way mosquito surveillance is being done is a huge teamwork. They go to the uh, forest or different uh, high risk areas, collect mosquitoes by different methods. But we adopt a city and science. First of all, you know, Newfoundland, we wanted to cover the entire province. There was no such data uh, which gives the full picture of the province. So that was a bit ambitious. And we realized that it is not possible with the traditional way of doing surveillance. It is very expensive. We need huge human resources. And uh, the logistically also, it is a big problem. Travel back and forth from St. John's to all remote areas. And also the timing, I mean, uh, it is a whole year, if not winter time, but early spring or spring to late fall, that a huge time, you know, the lag. So it is not possible for us to conduct traditional way of uh, collecting mosquitoes. And we found city and science is the best approach. And also we found that in literature, the, this is the best way to reach out to the community. Even if community is, is involved in mosquito collections or any kind of public health approach or activities, it has different impact in the society than if we have a top-down approach, a group of researchers and going and collecting samples with little community involvement. And our project plan is not just simply, we got some funding from PHAC that finished data some uh, collections and published articles and done. We are actually developing a, a long-term relation with the community because climate change is such an issue. It is making things worse, too bad to worse and getting further down, further, uh, you know, the deteriorating the situation conditions. So community who are actually going to be at the brunt of this, um, this uh, climate change, I think it is best approach is to get involved in this initiative because any kind of intervention in future, ultimately the community will be involved. And making an army of community, the city and scientists in every community will be the best vehicle actually to reach out to the rest of the community because they are local people. 
and also is the knowledge you are to translate giving knowledge not confined to the universities we are translating the knowledge to action and involving the public and it is proven it is not a citizen science is not a very novel approach it was done in many other countries uh, particularly the mosquito collection also found in european union some countries in spain and the holland and also in us they found it very effective uh, and also it gives a new dimension in governance the how to involve the public in decision making uh, advocacy and uh, policy change and climate and the citizen science is the best way to do that so our approach was that uh, we first we build uh, our centralized team at memorial university that includes the faculty interdisciplinary faculty we have a public health we have four professors from entomology virology climate science we have cross appointed uh, faculty who is retired provincial veterinary officer we have technical professionals that are trained in mosquito identification virus isolation and identifications and we have a great graduate students who will be future leader in, in this particular field and climate and citizen science needs a strong partnership so we make a little partnership with Newfoundland Labrador Eastern School District in order to reach out to junior high, high school, and um, the environmental organizations, NGOs, uh, community-based organizations, municipalities, indigenous communities, other students in New uh, Memory University and the faculty and staff. We organize multiple workshops uh, before actually collecting mosquito samples. We demonstrated them how to collect the samples that I will show you in subsequent slides. And you know, nowadays you cannot do anything without social networks. So we need, uh, uh, so we have a separate Facebook, we have a Twitter, we have separate email, we have our phone number, separate Memorial University phone number. You make a YouTube video uh, that gives a five, six minutes video, which is uh, one of our graduate students. She made a wonderful video and that video gives the actual demonstration how to collect mosquitoes how to fill a form and we shared the link to all the city and scientists we have printed instruction page collection tube we call aspirator or putter and we give all the arrangement of the shipment of putter to the uh, city and scientist give instruction we give self-address prepaid envelope so that they once they collect the samples they can put in the envelope and, and seal it and send us directly to our biology lab. And uh, we have a separate dedicated space we kept for storage of the samples. Now you can see there's uh, some ideas of what, how was uh, the our Facebook. This is the Facebook still active. You can also visit. Uh, this is the logo we made, a mosquito with a belly full of red blood. And, uh, and this is the, the screenshot of the video. Uh, and video was liked by so many people. They said it makes the things so easy for them to understand uh, do's and don'ts of sample collection. And now this is aspirator. It is very simple tube. Anybody can make it. Um, it's a, some plastic tube with a blue cap. We make two holes. Uh, one hole with a small tube, which is basically um, just to suck like another you know, vacuum cleaner, you know, we suck. And the bigger tube, basically one mosquito, we allow the mosquitoes sit on our body or someone's body and any part of the body, then we suck the mosquitoes. You can see in the middle of the picture, there is a small you know, mesh. Otherwise, you know, mosquito might go inside your mouth, you know, go to stomach. Actually, I initially, it is a learning experience. We did not make it. I saw a couple of mosquitoes in the initial stage, but in any way, it is a good source of protein, organic protein, so it is fine. Uh, it didn't harm me. So, uh, so this is the very simple uh, tool. Anybody can make it at home. Anybody can use it. It doesn't need any high tech, no power, you know. And this is the uh, picture. You can hang it from you know, neck, around the neck and while going for hiking, the moment you'll find mosquitoes, just collect it. And you can see the right hand side, the mosquito is still buzzing inside a tube. If we go to, again, going back to the previous slide. If you look at a left picture, you can see that the sticker uh, and the sticker actually basically to the ID, ID of the uh, particular tube, which is being already made. It is, it is blank, but when we send it to the city and scientist, we gave a separate code number 
And what they do, they put their name, the locations, and if, uh, the fill up. And then they have the form. This is the form we made. One is the instruction on the left hand side uh, with the contact details. And the right hand side, you can see the data sheet. Uh, so the, now you can see three different uh, uh, space, uh, tables for three different tubes. Uh, and you can see the name, phone number, email, any comments. And these are in, integral part of our uh, uh, sample collection. Since we worked in uh, saint pierre Miquelon, so we also made it in French, and this is a French form. So how samples were mobilized? Basically, the, uh, we, we conducted the study in 2018 and 2019. So uh, citizen scientists are told to collect the samples, not necessarily they have to send immediately after collection, they can keep the after mosquitoes collected from one particular location for one particular tube. If they change the location in different areas, then uh, they have to co collect from other tube. And they are in the form, there is a option to mention the latitude and longitude of the area because we wanted to study the spatial distribution of the of the species of the mosquitoes. And uh, no, one and they are asked that once they come back from the field they can uh, seal it and they can keep it in a freezer. And uh, before this uh, shipment, they keep all the tubes in an envelope, uh, the envelope they are provided and just directly shipped to us. And at a lab, we had a people who were involved in collection of samples, immediately after receiving it, put it in our uh, uh, freezer and what are the forms immediately we put in our master spreadsheet. So, and um, once we uh, uh, get a time, then having sufficient number of samples, we had uh, uh, Kate who she is expert in, uh, uh, in mosquito identification and the microscope. And sometimes we need a PCR if there are any kind of confusion. And for virus study, uh, we had a pool study because of the lack of uh, staff and a time that we'll discuss it in a later. Now, we actually uh, tar um, targeted flavivirus, mostly causing the diseases like yellow fever, dengue fever, Japanese encephalitis, or West Nile or Zika virus. Then California Zero Group, which is causing Jamestown, Canyon, and Snowshoe, Snowshoe Hair virus, and Bunia virus. So what are the major findings? First of all, you can see the, uh, the location of the participants of citizen scientists and the sample locations. You can see that almost every area, except very small areas in the western part of uh, uh, Newfoundland, that all entire province almost cover. This is the most exciting part. That we, uh, this is the first time we covered such a vast geographic areas. Indeed, it is not a hundred percent, definitely not. But you can see that we have not left major geographic areas. So we have almost covered the entire province. And the species we actually we found that this is the result. It is very, it's a very messy data because so many samples we got, but we tried to put it in a very simple form. We found 32 species, including three invasive species we identified. It is Japonicus, it is Vexens, and uh, Culex pipiens. And all these three uh, uh, invasive species we found in Newfoundland. In Labrador, we found uh, it is Vexen. And in Sapir Mikolan, we found Aedes japonicus and Culex pipiens. And seven pools of mosquito tested positive for the snowshoe hair virus, one pool tested for the Jamestown Canyon virus, 19 for potentially positive for California syrup group, and one potentially for the Bunia virus. But uh, we need to further lab work uh, to confirm and type these results because of. Again, the pandemic actually affected our work severely, but I'll discuss it later. Uh, so uh, the pool, uh, basically the one tube having all the mos mosquitoes we actually tested for the virus, uh, not uh, separating them because it, it might need it so much time and resources. And because of this pandemic, we are running out of time uh, and the resources. So we have decided to have a pool but advantage of this that we at least, even if identify the virus, you may not identify the corresponding species linked with that, but we identify the location where the virus is found. So it will give us an opportunity to go for further study in those areas for detailed 
mosquito sampling in future and ecological studies. So uh, we also found that uh, the pool containing Aedes vexans, Culex pipes, did not show any virus positive. These two invasive species, um, but no virus found these invasive species. From Japonicus, uh, we found that uh, 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 it was, uh, <coughs> we found uh, the snowshoe hair virus, but uh, that is a mixed uh, mosquitoes uh, pool. So a um, study from elsewhere show that it is Can Canadiensis and Cuminis actually are known vector. So in other words, although we identified the invasive species, but we could not identify definitely proven virus in those uh, uh, invasive species. But also it is true that we found these invasive species in very localized area, not uh, all over the province. I will show you the map. And in the map, you will see the actual location of those mosquitoes. And also the, the virus we found that, uh, uh, <clears throat> so for example, uh, Jamestown Canyon and other viruses, but those viruses are actually found in the native species. That is an interesting finding. These all mosquitoes like Aedes pionips, Aedes provocans, Aedes puncter, Aedes communis, punct and Coculitidia perturbans. These all are local uh, species. So virus is actually circulating within the uh, local or uh, native species. That means that um, although those viruses are found in some localized area, if if you assume that climate change can further spread because uh, temperature also helps in mus uh, virus multiplication within the mosquitoes, assuming that that then uh, in in the future there is always a risk of spreading virus in rest of the province. Moreover, uh, we already have identified uh, the invasive species it might spill over to the invasive species. And these mosquitoes, the invasive species, these three invasive species, they are potential uh, vector for West Nile and other virus. So if we have these mosquitoes already thriving in Newfoundland weather, that means in future that um, it, if they spread and if the virus comes from, uh, from other mosquitoes, the same species, uh, either by transportations or by strong wind or whatever the uh, mechanism, the the already these in, uh, other invasive species can be a potential vector and disease can transmit. So the, we have already identified this area as a high risk area. Now, although uh, the public health data doesn't show any human cases of West Nile virus or uh, Zika or any such kind of disease from different Labrador, and uh, so. There is no human case, but um, the area is already at risk. So it also interesting thing uh, uh, we have discussed with, uh, we are in touch with uh, uh, National Microbiological Lab at Winnipeg, you know, where actually I got some short training on muscular identification also. Uh, the, the, according to those experts that Newfoundland Labrador now, which is very perfect, ideal uh, space, uh, place actually to, see to monitor, regularly monitor uh, how the disease can come and spread because other parts of the country and uh, our southern neighbor in US, it is already spread across the provinces. But he did, this is the right place to study, to do research in a place which is there is no such disease, how the disease begins, how the monitoring can be integrated in a health system and how to intensify the monitoring in order to identify the first index case and see how disease spreads. And the best example is the ongoing COVID, for example. It is uh, how people are monitoring the spread of disease. So Newfoundland Labrador, I think it is a very exciting place now because there is no disease so far, but we have the mosquitoes and this is the place anytime the disease can flare up. Now, if you look at the ecological uh, background of this virus, it found a species which are uh, carrying the potential uh, California cellar group, the mosquitoes are actually collected from either from residents or from forest, from running water or permanent water. Permanent water means we see a lake and ponds, running water means essentially springs and uh, rivers. O on the other hand, snowshoe hair virus, we found in the mosquitoes which are collected again from residents, also from forest. On the other hand, Jamestown Canyon virus, we found from the mosquitoes which are collected from running water. So that is also another interesting public health uh, you know, uh, message that 
uh, although there's no human case, uh, but we found the mosquitoes carrying virus, we found from residents. Now, you know, I, I'm from phys, uh, medical background, and I remember when I was in India, the place where, where I practiced my internal medicine, that area was endemic to Japanese encephalitis. And uh, uh, the typical clinical features of Japanese encephalitis is basically, it is one in 200 cases, actually, infected patients come with the clinical features. Rest of them, either they don't have any clinical symptom or they don't have a, maybe a very minor symptom, they don't go to physicians. So I am not very much convinced if people say there is not even a single case of California seropositive, any disease, you know, in human in cases. Perhaps uh, doctors missed it. Perhaps the cases are not that severe, not tested. So, so that is, again, putting another big question mark, how to improve the surveillance, human surveillance in this province when we already have identified the virus from the mosquitoes which are caught from the human residents. And this is the uh, uh, map you can see, uh, the location of uh, James Turkerian virus, the part of Newfoundland and also the snowshoe hair virus, which are confirmed cases. And these are the potential cases. You can see the more extensive areas and we are expecting to complete our virological studies. We already have one graduate student he will start the work as soon as possible. Now, this is the Japonicus and Culex pipiens, two invasive species, which are uh, found in Newfoundland only, and you can see the location of those uh, virus, uh, those uh, invasive species. Mostly you will find in Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland, which is most populous part of the province, and also part of the eastern part of the island. Uh, Vexen, we found both in Newfoundland and Labrador. Again, the Avalon Peninsula is again in a high risk area. Now, if you see this uh, uh, native species, you can native species you found uh, extensively in the island. Uh, the reason actually showing this particular six native species, because we found virus with the uh, associated with this species. And we, uh, as I mentioned before, potentially the, the mosquito of this species can further transmit to rest of the province and maybe human also be affected. Another interesting point I would like to mention, the way we collected mosquitoes, we did not use any trap. We al allowed humans to be trapped kind of thing, you know. So that means that these mosquitoes are attracted to human body or human body smell. The problem with the trap is you may trap the mosquitoes, which are either may bite humans or may not bite. You know, and here is these mosquitoes are sure shot they they are sitting on human body to bite. So that actually uh, separate out those mosquitoes which are not attracted to humans. Perhaps they uh, uh, suck blood from the animals, not from humans, because not all mosquitoes bite humans. So these mosquitoes all are collected from uh, from the after they sit on human body. So this is that means that the human beings are vulnerable to be bitten by these mosquitoes. And uh, then we add in, uh, then we analyze the performance of citizen scientists. Uh, uh, are they how are they doing it? And I compare with the faculties and researchers. As I mentioned that we conducted a study in 2018 and 2019. Uh, 2018, we collected a very small sample because we started our project late. We got funding late and we had some administrative issues and also a lot of uh, ethical uh, clearance from the Newfoundland Labrador English School District. So we, we actually started almost late summer or early fall. So we collected less number of samples. Although less, but uh, you found that actually faculty researchers performance was was the city and scientist. They did better job. But we somehow we found it to be very embarrassing that that uh, city and scientists are beating us. So we geared up. We said no more mistake from our side. It will be embarrassing. But uh, so, uh, uh, so overall performance improved both ways. And uh, the major problem we found with the, uh, with the samples we received from city and scientists, sometimes they sent uh, empty samples. I, th I think the, the empty containers, the, one of the reasons might be communication issues, perhaps they could not catch it and they sent the empty. We told them that if you cannot catch any mosquitoes, keep it with them, maybe next year you can do that. And uh, 
uh, sometimes it is some form of unknown reason. I, we found filled with water. Sometimes some mosquitoes are damaged. Uh, some incomplete report. Sometimes some of the tubes are full, I mean, overflowing with the mosquitoes. It was really difficult to uh, segregate and analyze. Otherwise, overall performance was 83% uh, uh, putters or aspirators are perfect. And that is very encouraging. Another issue is that month-wise sampling numbers. You can see that from the week of 26, 27 to 35, 36, we get highest number of samples, very high number. Very simple reason, because that is basically July, August, at a time, mosquito number increases, but also the people become free. They go, for, go more for hiking, school closed. So it is very difficult to expect uh, getting mosquitoes uh, you know, in the month of June or May or late uh, fall when uh, again school opens, uh, early falls when school opens. So it is understandable that um, uh, it is nothing to do with the mosquitoes ecology only, but it also availability of the citizen scientists to collect mosquitoes. So there's a good learning experience that in future we have, we are making, we are basically, it is a missed opportunity to get more samples in a, uh, early summer or spring and uh, early fall or late fall. So maybe that in the next future act, uh, act activities, we have to pay uh, more attention to get almost like a parallel line, the, uh, giving the almost equal number of samples fr um, from beginning to end. So as I mentioned, pandemic made our work really tough. In, we had a plan in uh, 2020, after we got the mapping of all the invasive species and also the other mosquitoes, we had planned to go to those specific geographic areas doing extensive sampling, uh, you know, almost like a, one or a half a kilometer or one kilometer radius, extensive sampling ecological survey and linking with the climate data also, because climate and ecosystem, ecological data, both uh, play a very equal role in mosquito survival and propagation. We, we cannot make any mere, you know, conclusive evidence and uh, statements simply based on climate data if we ignore the ecological data, like, you know, landscape, the water bodies, the visitations, and all so on. But we could not do that because we are not allowed, you understand 2020 was really tough. We are not allowed to use even the city and scientists to collect samples. It was banned and no lab or lab was closed. We actually started the virological studies at the late fall. And uh, that was another problem. Even this time also in our early stage, we had some kind of confusion of using city and scientists this summer. So it was, uh, it, it actually made our work difficult, a bit incomplete, but um, that's why we made it kind of a list of unfinished agenda. However, we finished our, whatever the samples we collected, we finished our all the analysis, except few uh, potential California serial positive potentials that needs further analysis. So what lessons we have learned? The lessons we have learned that citizen science approach is the best mechanism to conduct the mosquito surveillance in the large geographic areas. It is, uh, it can manage the cost, logistics, sustainability. And also I mentioned that it is a great experience working with the community because they will be a very strong future partner. But there is also challenges in the city, with city and science approach. And that is, I think any, any uh, city and science approach, uh, you will find a similar kind of experience. Like it, it is a continuous effort. It is not a one time you get funding and finish your uh, sample and forget it. Because you know that again, if you get out funding after five years, that doesn't mean again you re-establish you know the, with those people. Uh, city and science is a continuous effort, and more and more effort you make, then you have a stronger team, and also they are very willing to learn. So they make mistake, we also make mistake, but once you identify the mistake and point out, and they will definitely correct it, and you will have a very solid, uh, strong team. And though working for you in a remote area where you may not be able to go in a, for research purpose. And, uh, but in order to make it happen, we need a lot of groundwork. As I mentioned before that, before approaching the citizen scientists, we made our, all the social networking things should be, you know, well planned, making a good team, logistic plan, everything should be planned. Then you can go to the city and scientists 
it and it sometimes it is a bit frustrating you may get a lot of commitment you may find that they are not working they are not responding because every individual they have family issues personal issues so that we cannot that we have taken into account in your this kind of study this is a risk any risk, research having risk so the so citizen scientists these are the pitfalls but nevertheless this is a very good approach um, for i mean it can be replicated in the rest of the country and we are uh, more than happy to support uh, for if you need any kind of guidance and sharing experience the last slide is a way forward so what do we have to do we have to complete the virus analysis and we have to reestablish the citizen scientists which was blocked or uh, stopped because of pandemic and we have to expand our network obviously we need further funding we look forward if there is any opportunity um, uh, uh, happens you know with the phat we will definitely apply for that also looking forward to other funding sources and also we are very very much interested to uh, work in collaboration with other provinces particularly atlantic canada like nova scotia new brunswick pei and of course uh, the other mainland like you know in ontario quebec and uh, manitoba and other provinces uh, we, we we are more in, more than happy to work together and uh, we are very much interested to share this kind of presentation much more uh, less mystified a uh, more down to earth kind of presentation to the city and scientists now you know thanks to pandemic you know, this is the only silver lining for pandemic is that people become more much more familiar and competent in managing the uh, you, know, you know in the video conferencing or this kind of you know the virtual conferencing so maybe that in near future we will share this finding with all the city and scientists based on their ability and this based on their technology and definitely but we have already committed communicated with them once we get the mosquito result that was our commitment to the city and scientists and it is very important it is not one way communication we have to get back the result to them and some overall anal uh, no, advice they should not be panicked if i say oh you have invasive species at your home your bedroom you have to give a very assuring that that doesn't mean that you have a disease so um, so this is also uh, the risk communication with city and scientists is also integral part of the exercise and we are uh, interested to go for extensive field visit in high risk areas where we identify the invasive species and of course the where we found the viruses with that i'm going to end my presentation and uh, waiting for your questions if you have thank you so much dr sarkar that was really interesting it's neat to see all the work you've done across the province um, i'll just share my screen here a second here we are so um yeah, if anybody has any questions, now is the time to ask them. So you'll see a Q&A box either at the top or the bottom of your screen. So just click on that and um, please type your questions in and, um, and then I can read them out for um, Dr. Sarkar to answer. Um, also, just so you know, only us um, and you can see the questions, not everybody. So, and you also have the option to submit them anonymously as well. Um, while our participants um, start typing their questions in, um, I'm really fascinated by this uh, citizen science approach and how you engage people all across the province. Um, do you have any advice for other scientists who are looking to incorporate citizen science um, into their surveillance work or research? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have, we are, now we have just finished our analysis. We are going to definitely going to share with the infectious disease experts. We have uh, already have connections and we are definitely going to uh, share with them. And what is more, more important uh, part of this whole exercise is also you have to understand that some of the infectious disease comes with the symptoms, which is very sim uh, common symptoms, like, you know, fever, uh, I mean, some kind of just simple fever, little uh, some respiratory syndrome or some kind of you know prodromal I mean some body ache which is sometimes many often physicians ignore it and uh, think it as a normal viral fever something like that so it uh, fact of the matter is many of these infectious diseases like uh, I have mentioned those viruses actually have similar symptoms and or it doesn't require any medication mm. and that is a good part is that it is not serious most of the cases very mm -hmm. few rare cases gives hospitalization mm -hmm. but the challenge is that you know that it we may miss the cases right, right. so 
now it, uh, I am not the right person to take the decision because it is a clinicians take the decision, the clinical guidelines they have and provincial guidelines also. But I think it is worth what uh, uh, Anne-Marie Nichols asked that um, it is worth sharing with the infectious disease experts. And we need some kind of dialogue and see how best we can actually uh, reach out to the patients, uh, uh, doctors and get more in, uh, suspected cases. And then we can, we need actually some more uh, serological test of those patients to identify if some of them are having those antibodies of those against the disease. That actually gives more definite, you know, almost like in the COVID, you know, the definitive mm -hmm. uh, answer whether the humans are also exposed. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here. Um, so are, are there any plans to make California zero group virus infections reportable in Newfoundland and Labrador to help surveillance efforts for human cases? And are there any plans to enhance the knowledge of infectious disease practitioners and to consider a CSGV in their differential diagnosis, at least for encephalitis and meningitis? Yeah, I mean, I, did, I actually talked to some infectious disease experts. There is no, so far, there is no such human case. Uh, there is maybe one or two cases, but that is for travel related, not from local. So, um, but it's not necessarily all the suspected cases are actually undergone some, you know, investigation or serological test. So it is yes and no. I mean, I uh, nobody can confidently say that there is no human case, but also it is true that, uh, that there is no reported case of humans. But you know, if you go by science and then um, and uh, and uh, go by epidemiology and uh, risk analysis, obviously the presence of virus means that we humans are at risk. People go to field, they get mosquito bites. So the, uh, there are possibly that hu human eventually get disease. And then maybe there may be some cases, uh, some fewer severe cases, then things will be public. Now, as of now, since there is no human case, things are a little bit you know, laid back. But I think that uh, once we share the data with the uh, infectious disease experts and other doc family physicians, I think that there will be more vigilance and any kind of suspect. Because I worked in surveillance, disease surveillance of WHO in past in polio. There is also the same thing that uh, minor paralysis, people, doctors just ignore, not thinking it is a polio. But later mm -hmm. when you collect the stool samples and they collected the, and uh, go for virus testing, we identified polio virus in the stool. But by the time patient also recovered some minor paralysis. So it means, it, that happens in every disease. We have a spectrum of symptoms. So I think it is good to, you know, the uh, to uh, uh, to go for to go improve the surveillance. Mm -hmm. Great. Got a question here um, about the actual collection of the mosquitoes. So asking, um, did they submit larvae or just adult mosquito mosquitoes? So we're wondering about the reference to getting mosquitoes from running water. And did people submit just one time, or were they submitting uh, multiple times through the season? Oh yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, uh, see, the thing is, they collect they collect adult mosquitoes, you know, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and it is it varies from person to person. Some people they actually took 10, 10 containers, ten uh, you know putters, and they collected one month, uh, two weeks, you know, interval. Some just collected one, some collected two, or some collected five, but returned only one. Other five empties. They did not want to. They could not do that. So that is another challenge. We it is very difficult to do any kind of, you know, the seasonal change of, the, because it is, a, it is almost a cross-sectional sample by mm -hmm. one person based on the person's convenience. And uh, there is no such, I mean, we cannot compel them. Okay, you have to collect this, this, this particular <laughs> day. So, you know, that is the another ad, uh, disadvantage of citizen scientists. So we, we could not make much uh, in, a, in a specific geographic area. You cannot mm -hmm. make any uh, geographic, you know, the temperature or seasonal variation kind of thing. Okay. And um, in, in terms of numbers, how many species of mosquitoes, or sorry, how many of the invasive species of mosquitoes were collected? Okay. Uh, uh, for example, we found uh, uh, almost 12 or 13 sample locations. We found uh, uh, the uh, Japonicus and uh, PPNs and, uh, uh, and uh, Vexans also we found uh, uh, multiple locations in uh, in I, I can show you. I already showed you the map. You can yeah, see I think, these. Uh, I think the yeah. question is more. So, would you find just one um, one invasive species at a site, or would you find like you know fifteen or twenty 
um, of this, for example, the Pipians. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There are some, in some containers, we found multiple. You mean that in one particular containers? You mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, we wanted to, in some containers we found multiple uh, Japonicas. Okay. But again, again, but there is, again, again, here is a question mark because uh, the way mosquitoes are collected, and the number of mosquitoes in the containers, it depends upon the person's uh, interest and plan. Some okay. people actually decided to collect as many mosquitoes as possible in one particular place and fill the entire tube. And some people just collected two mosquitoes and went to another place, another three, four mosquitoes, did not wait for long. And that is also, and we have no control over it. So that definitely it is very difficult to ascertain and make any kind of, uh, you know, uh, com uh, said any, any kind of uh, comment on that, whether that area is having uh, full of invasive species, because it is a person's choice. Uh, you know, so that it, it, mm -hmm. it that is another challenge, in, you know, because they are trained in a, like any other entomologist that the protocols, we try to make it sim as simplify as possible. Mm -hmm. So some containers having, I told you, hundreds of mosquitoes, some containers just one. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to make any comment on that. Okay. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, got the questions rolling in now. This is great. Keep them coming, everyone. Um, so here's a question. So do you think it would be useful to reach out to clinicians at this time regarding the symptoms of some of the newer viruses that may arise from mosquitoes as they expand across Newfoundland and Labrador? And if so, do you have a plan for this type of work or are there are other organizations planning on doing this? Uh, no, it is very good. It's a great question. And that's, uh, that is actually we are discussed uh, right from the beginning of the project that how can we use the data in a public health policy? And uh, when uh, we are in touch with uh, actually the, our medical officers, and we shared uh, we shared our initial preliminary, preliminary findings, that definitely that it is extremely important to uh, to uh, share with the family physicians and the infectious disease specialists of the of the potential symptoms. If the, the when the patients comes with the, that present with the symptoms to doctors, whether the doctors will think of uh, uh, not just simple uh, viral fever, the, it might be because of these uh, other viral disease, which might be fatal if not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that's why we were, we definitely we will share this finding with the East uh, Regional Health Authorities and also the Provincial Health Authorities. But now the because of pandemic, things are so difficult because people are not thinking anything beyond the uh, pandemic. But uh, now once we settle down, and now uh, we'll definitely make a report and share the report with them. And also we'll organize a workshop with the, all the physicians as, as many as possible. And since I am part of the Faculty of Medicine, we have a system of reaching out to the remote uh, physicians working in the remote areas. We have mm -hmm. telemedicine. Uh, we organized a lot of workshop with, through telemedicine. And I am planning to share this finding via telemedicine to the family physicians working in the remote parts of the province. Great. Um, putting on that, we've got a question asking, does this suggest that the species are actually established in the profit province or it's just a, an introduction of the species? Ah, it is a big, it, it's a great question. We also have the same thing that how did they come? Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the native species that are there here for hundreds of years or thousands of years, I don't know. I mean, they're the native species. The, now the, uh, the, the uh, question is the invasive, three invasive species, how did they come? Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of, you know, hypothesis. Some people say, because we get, we get a lot of containers <coughs> from other provinces. We, you know, we, are, we get in Newfoundland particularly, via ferries, we get containers, mm -hmm. you know, the Newfoundland is isolated province and uh, isolated island and 90% food we import. We get everything from outside. So we have a trade which is get mostly come from materials come by via uh, containers. So uh, the the one hypothesis is perhaps via containers um, uh, we are getting mosquitoes because in other provinces like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, from where we get all these cargo are full of mosquitoes. Perhaps during the you know the off uh, unloading those stuff in the cargo in our containers, maybe mosquito can and go inside and they can bring the mosquito. That is one mm -hmm. theory. Second might be because of we have otherwise just by ferries, 
by plane or 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 even strong wind there are mm -hmm. studies that should be because we are not very far from the mainland coast so mm -hmm. and we have a strong wind there's a possibility strong wind can be a another potential uh, mode of getting mosquitoes from outside but the fact of the matter is those mosquitoes are thriving in newfoundland mm -hmm. weather and i i, I saw the name uh, 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 Robin Lindsay, so he is from you know in a national microbiological lab, and he actually gave me a lot of you know, knowledge to me. So and he and uh, in a Winnipeg, which is such a cold, we found um, uh, uh, the um, lot of invasive species like Culex pipiens. And I was told that potentially in the winter time, a harsh winter in Winnipeg, they survive just simply they go to the sewage system and mm -hmm. they remain there for the whole winter and they survive and they flare flared up in the spring. So mosquitoes are very one of the smartest uh, animals in the world. So they are, and they can survive anywhere. And so mm -hmm. they're surviving. So the, there are multiple means to come here, but they're surviving. And that is a worry. And if climate change is already there, I mean, the impact of climate change is already identified by the rest of the country, including Newfoundland Labrador also. So I think these mosquitoes are getting more and more favorable environment to to survive and, and spread. Great. Um, one of our participants brought up a really good point that as scientists, we see mosquitoes as many um, different species of mosquitoes that are out there, but the general population sees mosquitoes as mosquitoes. They're not seeing the difference between the native and invasive species. So what risk communication strategy do you have or plan to do to employ um, employ to convey that not all mosquitoes are the same. Um, you know, there's the assumption that people see mosquitoes as just being annoying, and people have heard of Zika, but we tend to think of it as like a, a South America problem, not a Canadian uh, yeah. transmitted and disease. Is a very good question. Uh, sometimes people here also say, "Oh, we have black flies, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, horse fly, all these kind of fly mosquitoes a little bit." I mean, them because we don't have any report of disease. I mean in a publicly, in public mm -hmm. domain, right? Mm -hmm. So people cannot, people don't think it is a big problem in Newfoundland. But uh, it, it's a very good question, how to communicate the risk. Um, all mosquitoes don't carry the virus, mm -hmm. but also it is true that there is a history of um, the mosquitoes which are not supposed to carry any virus, but later they are that particular species become carrier first uh, because there is a spillover effect and try, you know this, it, it is, uh, it carries from one mosquito species to another mosquito species. Mm -hmm. It is a history of that. So, and we already identified our native species also carrying virus. So it is not mm -hmm. an invasive species. Uh, this is a very, uh, it is an irony of the whole <laughs> our study. So, so the, in other words, the, whether the mosquito is invasive or non-invasive, whether the mosquito can carry the virus or not virus, the, the public health message will be very clear and simple. First of all, you have to protect yourself. You know that uh, the, there are standard guidelines how to prevent from uh, from mosquito bites. I mean, when you're going to you know the uh, the hiking or outdoor activities, uh, preferably uh, applying some you know the mosquito repellents, uh, which is environment friendly, non toxic mosquito repellents. Now, advising them to cover the whole body with the cloth. It's, it's not practical in sometimes, you know, I don't know about your experience, but I've seen sometimes temperature becomes so hot, uh, it is difficult to cover, uh, have a full covered uh, cloth. So, and, but also you know, when there is a, you know, people observe the more mosquitoes around their home, uh, either having their own screen, uh, door or window screen to prevent. And also uh, local health authority can also help because we found not in Newfoundland, but in other places that uh, artificial collection of water, for example, you know, the old tire, sometimes mm -hmm. people just keep it in a backyard and it piles mm -hmm. up, you know, that old tires actually are potential source of mosquito breeding because when it's a rain, mm -hmm. the water collects and uh, that is a perfect spot for mosquito breeding. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep your, your surrounding environment clean as dry as possible, mm -hmm. no collection of water or um, just drain the water. Mm -hmm. That will definitely, uh, at the individual level, people do uh, to prevent mosquito bite. Each mosquito is having their own range of fly range within their life, life cycle. 
So mm -hmm. it's not a one mosquito can travel thousand kilometers. It, some of them have 500 meters or one kilometers. So if collectively in a community, they keep their environment clean, no more artificial, no more garbage, no more you know waste. The uh, garbage management is very extremely important. If you people just throw the coffee cup, coffee cup collects water, that water mm -hmm. can be a source of mosquito breeding. I mean, some of the species, like some edis species actually very smart in this case. I have seen in India that even the, the Coke containers having the Aedes aegypti uh, larvae in the, in the uh, Coke mm -hmm. containers all uh, collected rainwater. So these mosquitoes are quite smart. So the people can do prevention of biting by when they're doing outdoor activities and keep their environment clean. Good, I think that's a good lesson for us all to take from this. Um, I think we've got time for one more quick question here. So um, someone asking that, you mentioned that there were um, some uh, insects other than mosquitoes captured in the tubes. Um, can you tell us what they were? Sorry, what is that? It, uh, some, when in doing the citizen science tube collections, uh, is that sometimes uh, you, you mentioned that there were things other than mosquitoes in, collected in uh, yeah. the tubes. So someone's wondering what they were. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes a moth also, some moth looks okay. like mosquitoes, you know, small, mm. even, even uh, let me tell you, I, I am telling, I'm disclosing my mistake. I, one, I also collected one small moth. It looked like a mosquito, mosquito. <laughs> and, and it was big embarrassment that uh, I also collected a small moth and so oh, it different, looks like different species of mosquitoes and uh, <laughs> our uh, entomologist said, no, 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 it is a, it, it is a moth. It is not, it looks like a mosquito, but not a mosquito. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I am I I strongly believe that don't be too specific. Collect whatever you you suspect, collect it. Mm -hmm. If it is not a mosquito, we will find it and we will discard it. But uh, no judgment. Uh, even any mus moth uh, moth like creature uh, or see uh, rest on your body, collect it. If you think that it is looks like mosquito, mm -hmm. don't don't ignore that. You know, uh, that is my my policy. Yeah. That's great. It's a good learning opportunity for us all. Um, I'll close it off. We've got one last um, comment. It wasn't a question, but um, one of our participants just wanted to note that good citizen scientists collaborators include those who also benefit from the results, including municipal governments, federal um, and provincial parks, and that they can advise their residents and um, uh, visitors of any potential risks, which I think is a great um, thing to yeah. note that as you were talking, you know, it's really about this collaboration and building those connections um, so they can be longstanding. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I I appreciate this. In fact, uh, it reminds me, I forgot to mention in my presentation, the provincial and federal parks also played a very important role in our study. They also collected mosquitoes. They helped us. They allowed us to work in their field. I mean, we collect a lot of mosquitoes from the federal and the provincial parks also. They are very, they are very helpful. Yeah, that's great. It's good to have those kind of partners. Um, well, I think that's all the time we have for the webinar today, but um, thank you so much, Dr. Sarkar, for speaking with us today. It's very interesting to learn more um, about your citizen science work across Newfoundland, Labrador, and St. Pierre et Um, If any of you have any follow-up questions for Dr. Sarkar um, after the webinar, you can always contact me at gpritchard at cpha.ca, and um, at, you can see that at the bottom of the screen there, and I'll be happy to connect you with our presenter today. Um, Thank you again all for joining us today. As a quick reminder, please don't forget to fill out the evaluation, um, which will come up at the end um, once you close the webinar screen. Um, it's just really helpful for us to have that feedback. Um, so please do that. And um, you all just have a wonderful afternoon and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jillian, for organizing it. And thanks for all the, all the uh, listeners for patience and asking questions and I'll be more than happy to have any further questions and please feel free to contact me. That's great, thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Right.